Back on February 17, 2015, History.com listed eight works of literature that were significant and written from prison. Maybe you know these. Number five was Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf written by the younger and now infamous Hitler as he sat in prison in 1923 after a failed coup landed him there. He spent months writing My Struggle, which as quoted in the article was a mammoth volume that was equal parts memoir, political tract, and racist screed. Number four, John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Pro Progress. Maybe you've read that written by this tinker turned separatist preacher who was jailed in England in 1660 for his illegal religious gatherings and preachings which sat crossways with the Anglican Church. This religious allegorical story of the Christian crusader on his adventure to the celestial city inspired generations to come. Number three, Nelson Mandela's autobiography begun in 1974 while he was incarcerated at Robben Island for his anti-apartheid uh, activism which got him 27 years hard time eventually got him recognized as a real leader in South Africa and became their first black president. Number two, Marco Polo's travels, which the world traveler dictated while in prison in 9, or 1298. Uh, later it was published and it put him on the map as one of the great explorers of all time. And then maybe if you didn't know these, maybe you would know this one. Number one, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, April 1963, when King had to answer this group of Birmingham clergymen who challenged him and his movement on how he and they were conducting themselves. And he famously defended himself and the movement that fought for justice with this line, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Those are significant letters, documents written from prison, but I would say none has affected more people for the good than the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote from his time under arrest. And so today, we're going to begin a series, a sermon series, on one of the letters. This one, you may know, it is called Ephesians, or Letter to the Ephesians, or to use the old word for the letter, Epistle to the Ephesians. Now, this may come as a little bit boring to you, but I hope not. It's just the basics, like who wrote it? Where was the letter sent? Well, you read the first couple verses and you may answer some of those. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful ones in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul wrote it. Uh, but even with that being written, not all have accepted his authorship. Uh, I think if you look for yourselves at the evidence, you stack them up against his other letters, especially the great similarity with uh, Colossians, then I think you'll agree that it looks and smells and sounds like Paul. Now, I accept it as his without reservation. And if he was a prisoner while writing this, like you'll see in chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 1, that it makes sense that while he's a prisoner for that first time in Rome, that would make the date of this perhaps as early as 58 A.D., but more likely 61 to 62 A.D. And listen to his authority. An apostle picked by the Lord, given this responsibility by the will of God, he writes, he didn't have this responsibility because he achieved it or went after it or grabbed it or stole it from somebody. He didn't plan to do this. Paul did not major in college in this. He didn't prepare early on to do this for a lifetime. He didn't plan on dying back then for this. Don't forget, Paul was against Jesus in those early years. He traveled around despising the name of Jesus and persecuting all who followed him if he could get his hands on them. But it was the Lord himself who came to him, knocked him on his keister, upset his world, turned him around in a different di direction, and gave him some new marching orders. Uh, Hughes put it like this, on the Damascus off-ramp, he met the lion of the tribe of Judah and heard his call. So you can blame Paul for what Paul is doing here in writing this letter, but Paul puts the responsibility on the shoulders of the Lord God Almighty and says, he has done this for me. You may notice when Paul writes his letters, he loves to use the word apostle 
when he speaks of himself. Uh, so let me say a word about the word apostle, since there are some churches around that still use the title. The word really just means one who is sent. So in general, anybody who's sent out for the Lord's sake could be considered an apostle. It's okay to use that. Uh, but to use the title in the way the Lord did and His chosen apostles and the early church generally used it, that would have really kept it with only the ones who the Lord had specifically chosen with His own lips, pointing to them and saying, now you follow me. And that's all, just them technically. And he writes to God's holy people in Ephesus, or as the King James says it, maybe your reads, yours reads, to the saints in the church in Ephesus. Now, just so you know, maybe boring to you, but the words in Ephesus are not in the earliest manuscripts, and you possibly have a footnote to explain a little bit about that. So most just assume these days, and I agree with them, that it's probably meant to be a circular letter. It's sent out for lots of churches to read in Asia Minor, including of course including Ephesus which was one of the great cities and we may talk more about Ephesus later but maybe not intended for them and them alone and that phrase to God's holy people or the saints that word saint has been taken and I think placed on a small group of people through history in some ways unfairly uh, th those who were extra, extra special, as some would say, or as maybe supposedly miraculous, something happened to them. Uh, it's not all that biblical, though, because when saint is used in the scriptures, it's just those who are made holy by the Lord. And I want you to know that. You can study it on your own if you'd like. But those people are consecrated, set apart for God's purpose. So, this may come as a shock to you, but if you are in Christ, if you are bought with the Son's blood... If you have the Spirit of Christ living in you, then you are a saint, no, no matter what others think or say or believe. And so this church is full of some good saints, and none deserve that title except that it is given by the Lord who made us by His grace that, not our own glory. So I hope you know and I hope you take that seriously. You, my brothers and sisters, are saints. McGee writes about the pots and pans used in that wilderness tabernacle as being called holy vessels. And if you remember those days when the Israelites would put up the tent very carefully and use it while they stayed there, then pack it all up and the priest would carry it away to the next stop. He, he assumes that these things were not called that because they're nice or pristine or perfect. He, he guesses at the, at the end of the wilderness wanderings, those pots and pans that were sacred and holy were probably a little bit dent, dented and beaten up with some really good use. And he says they were holy because they were for the use of God. A saint, he goes on, is one who has trusted Christ and is set aside for the sole use of God. There are only these kinds of people today, two kinds, the saints and the ain'ts. If you're a saint, then you're not an ain't. Saints should act saintly, it's true, he says. But they're not saints because of the way they act. They're saints because of their position in Christ. They belong to Him to be used of Him. And pay attention to these words, in Christ Jesus, Paul writes in verse 1, because that is an ongoing focus in the letter. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Put a pin in that, the phrase, and don't let it go because that thread will continue throughout the whole thing. Did you also see how Paul began his letter? And if you know any of the other letters of Paul, it might sound very familiar. Two words that he loves to use and use often. Grace or charis. That's the greeting in the Greek world. And then peace or shalom, the greeting in the Hebrew world. And Paul pulls both of these worlds together by using both of these world words together, combines them and lifts them up to be something more than just a mere greeting. It says something. And we'll talk about that too. Now that is what we learn from just the first verses of the letter. If you wanted to know how this letter got to the Christians, for that, you'd have to read the letter. But if you haven't read it, let me help you. Skip ahead to the very end of the book and read the last few verses. 
Tychicus, or however you want to pronounce it. The dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Paul says. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Again, he uses the words, peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. So it's Tychicus that Paul sends with the letter in hand to go to these churches as a representative to say how Paul is and to find out how they are. And those, I guess, are the basics. Now, what do you know about the letter? Have you read it? Do you know it? More than have you read it, has it impacted you? I hope in your life group you'll look through the letter quickly and just pull some things out that maybe could be a good. I hope you'll read this too. Read ahead. Next week, as we get into it, starting in verse 3, read it tonight. Read it tomorrow. Read it this week. So at least you'll be ready to learn and to grow and be encouraged. Let me give you a little bit to wet your whistle. This letter is a celebration of Jesus Christ and His church. And we'll look at both of those together. Christ and His church. Christ and His church. And that'll be Paul's dual theme throughout. I like what Stout says, Stott says. Ephesians is a marvelously concise yet comprehensive summary of the good news and its implications. Nobody can read it without being moved to wonder and worship and challenged to consistency of life. The letter focuses on what God did through the work of Jesus Christ and what He does through His Spirit today in order to build His new society in the midst of the old. If you want to know how it's broken down, maybe this will help if you can remember it. Hughes says very simply, the summary is this. First, Paul states the doctrine, chapters 1 to 3. Then he states the duty, chapters 4 to 6. Or two other simple options, the wealth, chapters 1 to 3. The walk, 4 to 5. And the warfare, chapter 6. Or those same chapter divisions, sit, walk, and stand. But you go discover it on your own. Don't listen to somebody else and what they say about it. You handle it. You read it. You be challenged by it. But let me warn you, if you read this inspired letter, not so much from Paul, but from the Lord, and you take this seriously, you might just find something happening to you. Hughes says, Ephesians, carefully, reverently, prayerfully considered, will change our lives. It's not as much a question of what we will do with this as what it will do with us. So don't just come in here and let me tell you what I have read or what others have said. Discover the treasure yourself. And of course, let it change you. What do I wish for you today? The same thing Paul did to them back then. Grace and peace. Grace and peace from the Lord for you. It's what blesses you. It's what saves you. It's what comforts you. It's what sustains you. Something that grace is what we say before we eat and peace is what we have when we don't have war. That's way too shallow and that's not enough. Not biblically. Not in Ephesians. These are deep and meaningful words and Paul uses them and loves them and fleshes them out as he writes. And just so you know, the only way to have true grace and peace, the saving kind, is through the sacrifice of the Son of God, Christ Jesus. And Ephesians will say it. Are you saved by grace through faith? Have you given your life to Him, been united with Him in baptism? Have you given up on your sin and been holy, made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ? It's a great day to start. It's a great time to start this series with you who are in Christ. So make sure today you're in Christ. Let's stand and sing. Come if you need to.